Do all, I call it toothbrush rapid. Yo, you know I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. I'll be coming in the night. You know I got a knife. Yeah, you better hide. I'm coming in the night. And I'll fuck your bitch. And I'll fuck your bitch's bitch. And I'll fuck your mama. And I'll fuck your bitch. I don't give a shit. Look at my wrist. Got no watch on. Except this shit. A little Cassie, yo. Think I like a hoe. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. I used to don't anymore. <laughs> what you talking about, though? You think I know? I don't know nothing. All I know is muffins. <laughs> I like muffins. And, uh, that's all I got. <laughs> I can feel it. I can feel it. <laughs> I can feel it. I can feel my fucking sore. You fucking boomers on the bus. The boomers on the bus coughing on me. Coughing on me. Keep making me sick. I can feel it. It's coming for me. If it wasn't them, it was the fucking boomer in me ass. Because guess who else is sick? Me mum. <coughs> getting me sick. I can feel my throat getting sore. It's going to come in the next few days. Fucking bastards. <laughs> fucking bastard little viruses inside of me. Trying to, try to kill me. <laughs> so... I live my life in a state of near constant dissociation. If you don't know what dissociation is, it's uh, essentially being uh, separated psychologically from reality. So it kind of feels like everything's a video game uh, or like uh, like there's something off about everything. It's it's incredibly unsettling feeling and uh I think a lot of people have experienced it once or twice, but as I understand it, it's linked to anxiety disorders, if you get it a lot, and uh, I have over the years progressively increased the amount of time in my life I spend dissociated, and uh, at this point it is m the majority of the time. At first, when it would just happen once in a while, it would really freak me the fuck out. Because it's an incredibly unsettling feeling, as you can imagine. You you become hyper-aware of the fact that you are, uh, well, in my case anyway, I became hyper-aware of the fact that I'm, I'm looking at the world through my eyes, uh, but it's like almost an out-of-body experience where, I, yeah, I see the world through my eyes and I picture myself as between behind my eyes, but I can almost see the outside. Like, it really feels like I'm someone inside my head looking out at the world. It's yeah, very hard to explain in words, but, uh, yeah, it's it's quite unsettling. Uh, so, at first, I, this used to freak me the fuck out, and when I noticed it was happening, uh, very consistently was the cause of many a panic attack in the early days of my panic disorder showing itself. Um, however, at this point, uh, it happens so often that I know I, I barely even notice it. Uh, it's, it doesn't scare me anymore. I, I just sort of like, uh, I'm dissociating, huh? And I, I try and just kind of go along for the ride. And eventually, once I've distracted myself with something else, I'll be back in my own body and I, I won't even have noticed it anymore. Because essentially, once you stop thinking about it, uh, and and uh, even if it's still happening, if you stop really paying attention to it, in effect, it stops happening. It doesn't actually stop happening, for me at least. Like, it may still be happening, but if it's not affecting you in any way, like, it does, if it doesn't have any effect on your behavior or on yourself, then... Uh, it, it, in essence, it's it it's it might as well not be happening. So, I I live my life in a state of near constant dissociation at this point. Um, it's it's very common. Uh, it's just it's just a really interesting feeling. I have to say, it's a very interesting um, uh, way to live your life. As I understand it, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It can't be healthy. But it, it, it sort of leads to a lot of other side effects. Like, um, when, when you're generally conditioned, you know, it's very easy to fall into a sort of psychological loop where you, you sort of believe that the world isn't real or that you aren't real in a sort of sense. 
like just because of the feeling that you get, uh, which I have certainly fallen into in the past. Uh, right now, not so much, but you know, there have been periods in my life where I've been convinced of solipsism, uh, you know, convinced that that other people aren't really other people, or uh, that you know, a lot of stuff like that. Uh, the world isn't real. Uh, I'm just dreaming. None of this is real. That sort of thing. Quite not not particularly hard to to fall into when you're living in a state which seems to reaffirm those beliefs, uh, which is not good for my mental health at all. So, uh, and generally not good for like social interactions because it's it's really hard to have like a genuine conversation with someone when you wholeheartedly believe that the world, the universe is fake that you're just living you're just you're just living in a lie uh, well I can't say I completely disagree with that idea even to this day like the, obviously there's no way of proving that we don't that I, I mean, I don't have to go into this, this is some obvious shit, there's no way of proving that sort of thing, uh, and uh, as someone who has a lot, has thought about that a lot, I've come to the conclusion that, real or not, this is where I am, and if I can't escape, then this is where I'm going to be for the foreseeable future, uh, at least while I'm uh, alive in this body. Uh, I often so when when i explain this to therapists or psychology psycholo- psych- psychology expert type people they tend to i don't know i don't know cuz it's been a while since i've talked to a professional so who knows but when i when i used to talk about it it was seen it, he told me that it was like it on its own wasn't important it was just a side effect of my anxiety but what's interesting is that uh i believe it to be slightly different from that not necessarily completely separate from my anxiety but i have been on anti-anxiety medication to the point where i'm definitely not anxious about anything but i'm still dissociated uh which you could attribute to the medication itself doing that which is kind of interesting so i mean i know there's also ketamine and D- dxm and all that sort of thing which is an entire class of drugs called dissociative anesthetics which cause a very similar effect to what i experienced the first time i ever took mdma i experienced severe dissociation at first so it's very you know the way drugs can interact with your brain and make you feel this way it's um it makes me think that there's something slightly more to it than just uh, it's a side effect of anxiety disorders. I feel like it's it's something a little uh, deeper than that, a sort of uh, deep-seated mistrust of your own uh, subjective experience, your own senses. Uh, but I, I really am not an expert in this field and don't really know what I'm talking about other than anecdotes from my own brain. So I don't want to go ahead and make any assertions about the nature of consciousness or reality because I I don't think I am qualified to nor do I particularly want to but uh, these are interesting thoughts to have and I encourage you to think about them yourselves Uh, this sort of stuff is fun because what I mean once you the common thought loop I get into is once once I'm in this sort of state where 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 I'm dissociated from reality, it feels like I'm playing a video game, or uh, in some states there's 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 a derealization and depersonalization. I don't really know what the difference is, but I think one of them is you think the world isn't real, and one of them is you think you yourself isn't real. And I've experienced both sometimes simultaneously, which is really fucking trippy and weird. Uh, I think that's what they mean anyway. I might be wrong. Please correct me if I am. But um, when when you've experienced that so much, uh, it's it's very easy to doubt your own senses. But it also puts, gives you some interesting thoughts. Uh, you know, one of the thought loops that I get into when I'm in these states is really deep analysis of where my consciousness ends. And it's you know it's a uh, it's, it's I can't say anything else, and it's kind of kind of fun and interesting to try and explore, to try and really think about 
of what is you and what isn't you to try and really analyze that deeply about yourself especially when you're in a state where you feel separated from your own body uh, uh, it's impossible to communicate through language as well which is something very interesting it's an entirely subjective experience uh, you know something else i've realized is so so i know i i know i've been i've been talking about drugs a lot recently and i'm trying i'm trying not to because i i don't think it's a particularly interesting subject to hear about i find it uh, really boring when other people talk about drugs uh in like a non-educational sense in like a anecdotal personal sense like well man i've been smoking so much weed lately I'm like, wow, well done, good good on you, good job, you, 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 what do you want, a fucking cookie, it's not, an, it's not an, it's anything to brag about, it's not really interesting at all, uh, but I feel like I should, should talk about this because it's, it's relevant to these videos, I feel like I make much more interesting videos when I'm drunk as opposed to when I'm high, uh, I'm not sure why this is. Uh, I I stutter a lot more when I'm high, which is interesting. Like I, I struggle to find the words a lot more. Whereas when I'm drunk, I find it way easier to talk. Uh, with with a sort of, as as I I uh put it, you can tell when I'm hammered, because I start talking like fucking Shakespeare. All my fucking vocabulary just fucking comes out, and I'm like, hmm, yes, yes, um. Qualitative, qualitative assessment, yes, hmm, and that, hmm, molecule, <laughs> you know, I start, I start chatting all that bullshit, um, whereas when I'm really stoned, I, I just can't think of the words in the first place, and it's, you know, actually quite frustrating, to be honest, because, you know, you're, you're always having all these crazy thoughts, and you don't know how to express them, uh, but yeah, there you go, make of that what you will, and make of dissociation what you will, you know, I have a theory about dissociation that it has something strongly to do with uh, short-term memory, uh, like, like a sudden lapse in short-term memory, but uh, I have absolutely no proof of this, nor have I done any research, so it's entirely just a hypothesis for now, and uh, maybe someone who knows something about psychology can say something about that in the comments, or something, something but... Uh, there you go. That's that's the whole thing. I'm sorry. Did they just did they just translate? Hold on. Did they just translate yare yare as oy vey? Hold on. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm sure. I've, I feel like I've seen this before. But that imagine this little cow. Oy vey. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched two movies today. I watched um, Velvet Buzzsaw on Netflix, and I watched Dog Day Afternoon. Uh, neither of which I found to be particularly amazing. Uh, but yeah, Dog Dog Day Afternoon was an interesting one because there was like literally no music the entire film which I thought was a very interesting choice. I don't think I've ever seen a film that did that before. I've maybe seen one or two, but it's very rare. I think I've seen... I can only off the top of my head think of one other film I've seen that doesn't use any music for the entire thing, uh, which is this, like, obscure German film. Uh, I think it's called Violet or something. V v v v v like a female name that begins with V is what I'm jumping to. Uh, which is also about a bank robbery, now that I think about it. So that's interesting. Um, but yeah, that was that was a, that was a cool cool directing choice. But um, also the film was based on a true story, of like it, it that really happened. Which is interesting because I looked into the true story. So if you haven't seen Dog Day Afternoon, uh, it's basically a guy who robbed a bank, failed to rob a bank, but tried to rob a bank to um pay for his transgender wife's gender reassignment surgery made in also by the way the film was made in the 70s and it's very um it's it's uh, incredibly sympathetic to the main character and the gay community as a whole 
uh, which is pretty damn surprising for a film from the 70s like it's a uh, it's pretty pretty good pretty good for them to do pretty good on them you know but um uh yeah in the, the what's a shame is that in in reality cuz i looked it up after i finished the film in reality the guy's wife looked pretty much like very feminine uh, even I don't know. I only saw one picture of of her, but it like if you showed me that, I would have just thought it was a a woman. Whereas in the film, they make it very much a guy wearing like nail polish, which you know they always do this in films where they show trans people. I don't know what to think about it. I think it's a bit dodgy, but I understand why they did it, especially if it's in the seventies. That's the only complaint like I have with that bit of the film the main problem I have with the film is that it's just kind of boring uh, it is very realistic but I mean being a hostage in a bank robbery would probably be incredibly boring like they make in fact not probably that's kind of a part of the film is that the hostages are like messing around trying to entertain themselves because they, they're not being like violently kept under wraps like at one point one of the hostages is even playing with the rifle that the main guy's using like it's not fun not not it's it's just kind of a boring thing to be and the film is kind of boring itself like it's it's very realistic very plodding methodical paced and there's there's bits where suddenly a million things happen and then it goes back to the slow pace which is very grounded and realistic way to show what happened and i can't fault it for that but at the same time, it's not particularly, uh, you know, it, there's parts where I was like, I feel like I want to fast forward here. I feel like I know what's going to happen. I just want to get to the when the next bit of excitement comes, uh, which, you know, I guess this is just something that happens when you try and adapt real life events to film. You have to you kind of weigh up the entertainment versus reality. But in this case, you know, I can't. I just don't feel like I can fault the film for that since it is based on a real event and the real event took a long time so the film takes a long time uh, I feel like maybe, maybe it could have been paced better but I wouldn't really know what to do to fix it because that is kind of a part of the tone of the movie uh, so I, you know I wouldn't say I didn't enjoy it but definitely wouldn't say I didn't enjoy it it was a cool film I feel like I'm glad I watched it uh, but yeah, a little boring at parts. Um, then you've got uh, but Velvet Buzzsaw, which is a I think a Netflix original. Maybe it's not a Netflix original, but it's a, a film about uh, an art. It's a film about the high art world. Essentially, it's like a horror thriller uh, about paintings that have demons trapped in, like paintings that kill people. Essentially, like. When you buy one of these paintings, uh, you die a tragic... You die, like, in some horrific way. Uh, but it, it it's told very... Like, the, you know, one of the first things the, that people talk about with horror films is that the monster is never just a monster. It's, it's a metaphor for something, right? And so in order to understand any horror film, you have to understand what the monster really represents. Whether intentional or unintentional, what does the monster really represent? This is a very classic bit of thing when talking about film. And in this case, it's very obvious that the, the monster represents money in the art world. The film takes a very heavy stance that um, the high art costing so much money and being such a commercial venture is detrimental to itself and a bad thing that is corrupting uh, it's it's really fucking on the nose with this message like incredibly on the nose there's like four different um characters are character arcs that support this message that don't not even when we account for the main um like thrust of the main monster of the movie the main thrust which is interesting because the, the monster isn't really even a monster it's kind of takes a back seat to the rest of the movie but uh it's um i don't know i feel like a movie like this really hinges on having creative deaths and the deaths just weren't particularly creative or inventive 
Um, also, I, I think this was intentional, which is that it was definitely comedic at times, like a kind of horror comedy kind of thing going on. Um, there was some real, like, uh, horror B-movie, powerful B, like, horror B-movie stuff going on, which I, I found to be pretty funny. But the tone is just slightly inconsistent because I'm not sure if that was on purpose or if that was just a side consequence, if they were trying to go genuine. I believe, like, I, I, I think it went just fine after where I think it was on purpose. But then, you know, I, it's it just, it feels like it, it doesn't quite fit together with some of the other parts of the film that are trying to be more grounded. Um... But there, there is some, some stuff here where I, w- I thought it was like quite funny, uh, but which I wasn't sure if I was supposed to find funny or not. I think I was supposed to find it funny, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's it's not like a super dark, depressing horror film. It it's still kind of playful, um, but there's a lot of elements going on, and they don't like they just have slightly too much going on at once. Uh, to really focus in on everything, like they have some sort of, you know, it's it's really cool when horror psychological horror films do that stuff where it's like, is the character really being stalked by a monster or is the horror real or is it all is the person just going crazy, but like they sort of do something like that, but not really. Um, something that was really good is the art in this film because obviously they had to make up a bunch of fake high art for the high art dealers to be selling, which is what the film, you know, it's about high art dealers and a high art reviewer and stuff. And that was all done pretty well, except for there's one character who's like a, supposed to be, he was just selling his art on the street corner and he got picked up and became famous. And, uh, spoiler alert, his arc is that he's, he gets involved with this, this high art, world, high class world of of uh like big expensive pieces. His pieces are going for like really high prices and he used to be in this art collective uh and he's being told to leave the collective by his art dealer who is going to sell his paintings and break him overseas and make him multi millionaire and he decides at the end of the film to leave it all behind and go back to his art collective and, and do like a DIY thing which is, yeah, again, very on-the-nose kind of critique of, of what I was just talking about. Um, what was that? Why did I bring that up again? I forgot. I've completely forgotten why I brought that guy up. Uh, why did I bring his arc up? Um, um, <laughs> oh, fuck. Anyway, the film is pretty good, but it's, you know... Um, I don't know if I can really recommend it, per se, as much as, uh, it's, it's not super long film, I, I can't say don't watch it, because it was definitely entertaining, um, some bits were a bit stupid, it's, like, badly done, like, that guy's arc that I was just talking about, it's a little rushed, there's also some weird like, relationship stuff, like, the whole thing's kind of framed as a relationship drama, uh, like, between the main character, who's, like, a famous art critic, and this, this woman who works for one of the art dealers, um, oops, got my phone, but, I don't feel like they have that much chemistry, oh, by the way, by the way, th- I'm, I'm, a hundred percent certain that you're supposed to hate most of these characters, which is not good. Like, there's only two characters in the film that are truly sympathetic. One of them is uh the the guy uh, I think it's John John Malkovich's character is that his name John Malkovich, the 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 old artist guy who plays basketball, while he's painting. That guy who's who's pretty sympathetic. Uh, and then the the black guy who does the street art. Oh yeah, I remember why I brought him up. So he he does this this art, but they show bits of his art, and it's just really generic like graffiti art, which I thought was kind of lazy. Like they could have they could have done something much more interesting. There's a bunch of similar 
in real life black artists and there are doesn't look like that at all. It was like it was like kind of nineties style graffiti art. It's like come on mate, what are you doing? Um. But but in general, I I just don't know. I'm just like the deaths. Uh, there was one bit that was pretty fucking. Okay, firstly, firstly, this this movie. Every time I see a jump scare in a movie. I just immediately am de- like inclined to hate it, and this movie does have jump scares in a few parts. And I'm like, what the, the? It just feels so cheap. It feel it's like the cheapest possible thing you can do. So that immediately put me off, but I, I, I stuck with it. But it has so much stuff going on. Like the entire name of the movie, like the title, Velvet Buzzsaw, is like a really tiny plot point that they never go into about how one of the art dealers used to be in a punk band called Velvet Buzzsaw. But you, like, there's no... De- like, that's never important to the plot at all. Except right at the end, where it's not even that that's important to the plot, but, big spoiler alert, the m- person who was in Velvet Buzzsaw has a tattoo on her neck with, on the shape of a buzzsaw. And so the point of this ghost that haunts the art is it can take over other art, and that's how it kills people. It takes over their art. And uh, so she orders all the art in her house to be, like, removed and destroyed so that they can't hurt her. But in the end, the tattoo of the buzzsaw becomes, like, a real buzzsaw and drills into her neck, which was cool imagery. But, um, you know, it's... Like... I wanted to hear about the punk band she was in. I thought it was going to be some cool commentary or something like that. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't very cool. Um, but I feel like you're supposed to hate all these characters that die. Like all the characters that die are clearly bad people. So you're supposed to get a satisfaction when they die. But they don't. Like they're not. They're not that terrible. That it's really satisfying just to see them die at all. So the what would be best as if they had these like some sort of very inventive deaths but none of them only one of them had a death that I was really like um like in like particularly interesting uh but even that was just a sort of another on the nose commentary about modern art like so one of the person one of the people dies and um like everyone the art gallery just opens because everyone assumes all the security guards think it's just a just assume that she's a new piece of art the dead body and like the school children walk in her in the pool of blood surrounding her they think it's fake blood and only when her secretary comes in and sees her then everyone finally freaks the fuck out um which is kind of cool like that's kind of cool and spooky but it doesn't it's all, it's kind of like a ha 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 kind of thing, you know, like it's that reaction, a ha ha, kind of like a sort of laughing and a ha ha, you know, kind of reaction. <laughs> uh, but none of the other, like that's, that's, that's the best you get in this film. It, the, like the other, also the paintings, like the levels of their power and why they have that power is sort of only just a bit explained. Oh yeah. And also a big fucking thing, the trailer gives way too much away about the movie the trailer uses clips that are from like right near the end of the movie it's yeah i think i'm gonna give both of those movies a 6.5 out of 10